Hello, I'm Joseph Kasser and what I'm talking about today in my second annual Chesapeake Chapter Talk is building a better systems engineering postgraduate course, the research, the pedagogy and the results and some of them surprised me and will probably surprise you. Topics I'm going to cover are purpose of the research, the multidisciplinary research, what to present for learning, not necessarily teaching, and some of the subsystems, conceptual and otherwise, and how to present it, that's the pedagogy, the prototypes and the feedback from students and other people, what I call the 4% solution, the lessons learned, and then let's see if you can be a part of that 4% and where that 4% came from. The purpose of the research. Traditionally, one would write, to create a course to expedite the creation of outstanding systems engineers, some of whom will become technical leaders, or as we call them in Singapore, engineering leaders. So we need to determine, one, what to teach outstanding systems engineers, two, the best way to teach it, and three, how to fast track teaching that comes from experience. If it's going to take you 30 years to become an outstanding systems engineer, well, by the time you've done that, your industrial career is about over. Construct the course and prototype it. You think that's a good way? Wrong. You've got to look at it from a different perspective. The systems approach is create a system, not a course, a system. Instead of determining what needs to be taught, we first need to determine what systems engineers need to know because before we know what they need to know we don't know if we're teaching the right thing and then instead of determining the best way to teach it we've got to figure out the best way to learn it and then how to fast track learning that comes from experience and then construct the system and prototype it so we're now into multidisciplinary research we've got to understand systems engineering what they need to know We've got to go into the educational field and, and learn about learning and do some research into that. We've got to work out how do you fast track experience into learning. Moving on, the multiplanary dis disciplinary research. Well, magic happened. The outcomes from the research were a journey spanning three continents and 20 plus years. I came up with a set of requirements for creating outstanding systems engineers and I had to develop new and innovative systems thinking and systems engineering tools because some of the information I had could not be understood without creating a framework or some other tool to use. Lots of publications nobody seems to read. On my website and in some of in, and some are on Encoses and there's some, some YouTube videos that nobody watches. This will end up being one of them and a number of upset and uncomfortable systems engineers in COSI who felt challenged and confronted by some of the questions I was asking. And they were being taken right out of their comfort zone and didn't like it, and still don't like it. And it's a paradigm shift, because in order to be an outstanding systems engineer, you are totally away from the process paradigm. And I came up with a prototype. It's not a course, it's a program, and the course is only part of it. It began in December 2020 and it's still running and I'm now mentoring a few potentially outstanding systems engineers. And even though I have to get up at 5.30 in the morning in my winter time, I find it's worth it. Moving on, let's go into what to present for learning and some of the subsystem concepts. Part of the research showed that there are five types of systems engineers. The apprentice who has to be told how to do something Type 2, the practitioner who has the ability to follow a process. Type 3 is the problem solver who has the expertise to conceptualize the solution but cannot define the problem. Type 4 has the ability to examine the situation, can define the problem but cannot conceptualize a solution. And the Type 5 who is both a problem formulator and a problem solver and when this person becomes the engineer leader projects really hum and the colors refer to problems and solutions cans and cannots after developing the five types from observation did a literature check and I found this table 
or the problem solvers and the problem formulators differentiated between the abilities to find similarities and differences and I can map those into the types. The innovators or doers are just type 2, problem solvers are type 3, problem formulators are type 4, and the innovators are type 5. And when I group the types I find that systems engineers are type 1s and 2s, good systems engineers are type 3s and 4s. And look at the differences. A system engineer creates the system they're given the set of requirements and they can go ahead and create the system. A good systems engineer creates the system the customer asks for or solves the problem the customer poses. That's the type threes and fours. But the type five or the outstanding systems engineer creates the system the customer needs and solves the real problem. Notice the difference. Well, looking around Based on observations of systems engineers and students over about 30 years, I came up with something like this. Systems engineers are the green, good systems engineers are the yellow, and outstanding systems engineers are in blue. And the numbers are based on the Pareto Principle or the 80-20 rule. And we discussed this in the Oasis Cafe one session, and people agreed with the numbers. I find that interesting. And let's take a look at one way in which people can grow. Systems engineers become good systems engineers and eventually become outstanding systems engineers. Well, what does it take? To be a systems engineer, that's basic training in applied systems engineering. What's that? Get to it in a moment. It's one of the tools that I had to develop. So your CSET knowledge, for example, helps you become a systems engineer. Good systems engineers have advanced training in applied systems engineering, some project management, some training in pure systems engineering. What's that? Get to that in a moment. They have experience and they may have the book learning degrees and so on. But in order to become an outstanding systems engineer that really takes a mind shift. In order to bridge that gap between good systems engineers and outstanding systems engineers you need advanced training in pure systems engineering and project management and a lot more experience and you definitely need to be mentored. How do we determine what they need to know? The traditional way to do it is observe the scenarios of what systems engineering are doing in the workplace. If you do that you don't know what's missing. You don't know what they should be doing but are not doing. This can institutionalize poor practice and it's the business process re-engineering as is model. You then articulate the requirements and then as far as the process is concerned you identify factors that makes learning effective and then you come up with scenarios and requirements as above and then you combine the product and the process into the system that will create outstanding systems engineers. That's bad because it can institutionalize poor practice. So what's the better way of doing it? the product is outstanding systems engineers so you conceptualize scenarios of what systems engineers should be doing in the workplace. That's the difference. This is the BPR 2B model. You then articulate those requirements and the process identify the factors that make learning effective, the scenarios and requirements as above and you combine into the system that will create outstanding systems engineers. So the difference is you determine what the systems engineers should be doing as opposed to what they are doing. Now when you're trying to understand a situation there's the old story of the blind men feeling the elephant. The elephant is the system and they're trying to understand the system from a single perspective and they're not making it. So we need to understand the system from several different perspectives. One of the tools that I developed years ago, 20 years ago now, was I was trying to develop that body of knowledge based on what systems engineers are doing and what they should be doing in the workplace. And based on their role, they were doing an awful lot of stuff. We put together this framework that has Derek Kitchen's five layers of systems engineering or complexity as the vertical layer and the states in the system life cycle as the horizontal layer. And then we could see the scenarios in developing requirements, capturing requirements, or doing integration, 
doing testing and so on. But we found that they were doing so many different things that the body of knowledge would have to encompass project management, systems engineering, all the specialities and a lo whole lot of other stuff as well. So we gave up on it at that time. But the key concept that allowed us to get over that came a lot later when we split systems engineering up into systems engineering the role which is what the systems engineer actually does in the workplace architecting engineering and so on and systems engineering the activity which are the traditional activities associated with systems engineering I'll give you some examples in the next slide and the observations are as I just mentioned each person's role is a different mix of activities and maybe from more than one process domain and a type 5 person in one role may be a type 3 person in another role due to a lack of something. And so CETA is conceptual design, requirement solicitation, elucidation, management, architecting, interface management, testing, and so on and so on, modeling and others. And I looked back through the literature and I found one example that's probably well known, Sarah Sheard's 12 Systems Engineering Roles, published in 1996. But I also found, in 1969, 12 earlier roles published by William Jenkins in the systems approach. And these are totally different. I like role 5. By his overall approach, he ties together the various specializations needed for model building. There are three types of CETA. Pure systems engineering, that's what I call systems thinking and beyond, the cognitive skills of systems thinking, problem formulation, quantitative methods, decision making, and so on. And then there's the applied systems engineering, which I mentioned earlier, CETA, the activity, the traditional activities. Then there's domain systems engineering in the problem implementation and solution domains. There are three different domains, and each domain may be totally different. For example, if the problem is traffic congestion, the solution may be a su subway, and the implementation domain may be tunnel boring, or may include tunnel boring. Three totally different domains which require specialized domain knowledge when dealing with the problems. That's where multidisciplinary teams shine. It's similar to mathematics, which is split into pure and applied math. But if you look around at what's being taught currently, most of what's being taught is applied systems engineering although my data is dated. We can relate pure and applied domain CETA as follows. Systems engineers using cognitive skills while performing activities in a role in three domains. The cognitive skills is pure systems engineering. The activities in the role are applied systems engineering. The three domains are the domain systems engineering, problem, solution, and implementation domains. So what was my initial approach? Well, what is the first thing outstanding systems engineers do, or usually do, when they understand the nature of the problem? Hmm. Plagiarize. What? Actually, it's determine what other people in the past have done when faced with the same or similar problem. It's the concept behind TRIZ, and then you examine and adjust the other people's situations and your situations for similarities and differences in the situations you modify what they did accordingly you don't just copy what they did into your situation it may not be appropriate and so coming from academia my approach was to reuse course components to create the system I knew I was going to have a course as part of the system because that's the basic way these days we do the education so the education some system would be a course how do you create that? Well, I went back and looked at what are the processes for crafting a degree. There's the benchmarking approach, which is benchmark other universities, aggregate the topics, position yourself on top of the normal distribution curve, and teach most common topics. Didn't like that, because you're benchmarking other universities, but who says they're actually teaching what systems engineers need to know? what I thought they were doing was they were bundling the most common modules with modules that faculty can teach. Don't like that either. So invented one and it was published 2005. You take the customer needs, 
the body of knowledge and the benchmarks those that's the other university part customer needs are both the students and the student employers you create the subject matter knowledge and skills and then you figure out the delivery mechanism and factors that make learning effective so not only do you have your systems engineering domain you have your educational domain that creates the pedagogy you deliver the classes and then you have the feedback you assess the teaching and learning results it's a continuous loop and so my classes tend to be different each time they run hopefully they're improved Usually when I was working at NUS, I would look around each year and benchmark other universities. But in 2013, I took the opportunity to do a serious benchmarking study based on the institutions that were exhibiting at the Nkosi Symposium in Philadelphia. I think it was Philadelphia. Ten different universities and I was benchmarking our Master of Defense Technology System degree. And so if I looked at what was teaching based on that HKMF, I found that all of them were pretty much teaching down at the system level, which was to be expected. The courses they were teaching were requirements, design architecting, and integration and testing. And this is based on required courses. You can read the papers and see the detailed information if you really want to. And then Eileen Arnold and I looked at whether they were teaching pure systems engineering, applied systems engineering, domain, and so on. And we found nobody was teaching domain systems engineering except number eight had a little bit of it. They all had courses in management, and you could actually get a degree from Institution 9 without doing a single required course in systems engineering. Hmm. So a lot of the focus was on applied systems engineering, as I meant earlier, although there were a little bit of pure systems engineering. Now I had to think about what is systems thinking, because outstanding systems engineers need systems thinking. And it really depended on who you ask or who you read. It's difficult to learn. It's difficult to teach. There were two schools of thought, systemic and systematic. We looked around at it and came up with a holistic approach to use both. So we used the problem-solving process. Be all the blind men. Look at the different versions of systems thinking, and there were about as many different versions of systems thinking as there are of systems engineering. We, I was able to group all those definitions into two, systemic and systematic. So when we aggregated the views, we found that systems thinking is thinking about the system as a whole to gain an understanding of the system. The most useful view I found was Barry Richmond's Seven Streams of Systems Thinking. And systematic thinking is applying a methodical step-by-step -step manner or process to think about something or to achieve a goal. That's the problem-solving process. And then we go beyond systems thinking because as this person, whose name I cannot pronounce, said or wrote in 1999, we need both systemic and systematic thinking. There are some people for whom systemic thinking is system thinking and that's it. There are other people for whom systematic thinking is systems thinking and that's it. And the people describing their systemic thinking were having different descriptions as well. And then more than that, I found that Akoff wasn't entirely correct. Um, not sure I want to argue with Russ Ackoff, but Russ Ackoff was dealing, it was in working in operations research, and he was treating systems as black boxes, whereas we need, sometimes we need to look inside the system and see what's going on. So if your car won't start in the morning, understanding how the car is used, how it relates to the traffic, the roads, and other adjacent systems, won't help you determine that the battery's flat. Sorry, Russ. And so the perspectives you need to understand the situation depend on the problem. And you need even more perspectives to solve the problem. So we developed the holistic thinking perspectives. There's the elephant. We're looking at the situation. Big picture, operational, functional, structural, generic, continuum, and temporal, quantitative, and they all come together with a person and the scientific perspective is the outcome of the thinking, the hypothesis, the guess, or whatever you want to call it. And in this instance, the elephant was systems engineering. We needed critical thinking. 
I looked at different ways of measuring critical thinking and I found Susan K. Walcott's five levels. I liked them and has used them. No reason to reinvent a way of measuring critical thinking. So we put them together into a pr proposed maturity model back in 2010. And this is modifiable for different situations. So the knowledge of systems engineering, applied systems engineering, is related to the different types. The domain systems engineering is related to the different types. Pure systems engineering is related to different types. And then the individual traits necessary for the job are also listed. So if somebody needs communication skills, management skills, leadership skills, negotiation skills, whatever they are, you could put them in for that particular job. You could fill in the different domains in which they're working. If they're working in aerospace, they would require one set of knowledge. If they're working in industry, they would need different sets of knowledge and, and so on. It's easy to tailor for different organizations in different domains in different stages of the life cycle. So we took a look at what's being taught against competency model maturity framework. And we found out, sure enough, they're all teaching, except for eight and nine, applied systems engineering. And a few of them are teaching bits of pure systems engineering. As far as the cognitive characteristics are concerned, yeah, not much, but not too much. And the individual traits, mm, not too much. Two years ago, Professor Howard Eisner published this book on what makes systems engineer successful. It provides a description of how and why systems engineers can be and have been successful. He did a great IV and V job, independent verification and validation, on the set of requirements I came up with separately. Thank you, Howard. He offers the successful attributes, focuses on the key positive values, drills down into the success features to aim for and the failure characteristics to avoid. And he sets a model for achievement and behavior for future systems engineers to follow a successful path. If you're in any way interested in improving your systems engineering, this book is a must. It's thin, it's small, it's easily readable, and it's got a lot of good stuff in it. We figured out what systems engineers need to know and only explained a little bit of it. And now we have to deal with how to present it. From an operational perspective, a desirable section in academia is you have a lecture by the instructor. It summarizes the knowledge for the session and the reading, highlights the main points, adds additional material pertinent to the lesson. At that time I was doing the research, people were talking about using the flipped classroom. Instead of the lecturer giving the lessons, students read the material, then they come to class ready to discuss it. Great idea in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. Then you have group exercises, and that short discussion facilitated by the instructor is based on an assumption that isn't valid. So the instructor is lecturing instead of discussing. There has to be a better way. And then you look at it from the functional perspective. Students have different learning styles. Some learn by seeing, some learn by hearing, some learn by doing. That all has to be taken care of in optimizing and expediting the learning process. Something that's not really done very well in traditional academic settings. And teachers have different teaching styles. Some like lecturing, some like discussing, some focus on the type of knowledge, etc. And so you end up with boredom, poor performance, and dropout. I c can't tell you how many classes I have been bored to death in by the instructor. People are bored, they don't listen, so they don't do well on the exams. Nobody explains to them the importance of doing well on the exams. And then you get dropouts. And when you're dealing with tertiary education and there's competition for places in the classroom, dropouts are really a waste because not only does the student drop out, but because they got in, they prevented somebody else from getting in who might not have dropped out. We need to do something about that. And then there's issues with the effectiveness of the delivery method. I found this data a long time ago based on Dale's cone of learning and the learning pyramid and I redrew it in this way. You can see that lecturing and reading are the actual worst ways of learning something. And so what I did in my course was I turned that around. Instead of requiring the students to read the material before coming to class and discussing it, I require my students to read the material and then make a presentation based on the material. Top way of learning something. Practice by doing. That's the exercises. 
as well as the discussions. So the traditional flipped classroom doesn't deal with the top two. It just goes from lecture to discussion group. And then you've got to deal with attention span. I found this published in 1953 in technical classes. You can see how attention span goes up in the first five minutes and then it goes down slowly, ends up as a minimum at around 30 minutes, and then it starts peaking up at about 40 minutes. Book did not say how long the classes lasted, but I expected it was about 40 to 45 minutes because the attention span was picking up when the students were waiting for those magic words, class dismissed. So what's a more desirable situation? Based on some of the requirements I found, providing the five top aspects of the engineering design process, very similar to the systems engineering process, that best equip secondary students to understand, manage, and solve technological problems. Multiple solutions to a problem or requirement. Oral communications graphical or pictorial communications, ability to handle open-ended, ill-defined problems. What are those? Wow. And system thinking. Also, what we need to do is grade based on the cognitive skills and knowledge and incorporate the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Remember that we need to go beyond system thinking because system thinking provides understanding, but holistic thinking identifies the problems and provides the solutions. So I went back to the benchmarking data to see if any of this was being taught, and guess what? None of those five aspects showed up in any of the wording in any of the course descriptions on the websites of those ten institutions, except a slight allusion to systems thinking in three. Prototyping and feedback. Early prototyping results. I published this back in 1999 and I published this one in 2000. These were based on the similarities between classes and, symp and symposium results because I was looking into improving the effectiveness of distance learning. I came up with recorded lectures and so I was the first person to record lectures in the distance learning class at University of Maryland University College. If you think about it, there's not much difference between a classroom session and a conference presentation. You make the presentation, you, you discuss it, and then you move on. I ran the class twice. Students came up with two different versions of the technology. And so when I hear about the problems in COSI's having with the hybrid, I just laugh. Those problems were solved 20 years ago. I told you, I published a lot of stuff that nobody read. And if you're concerned about grading those academics amongst you, Look at the difference between face-to-face -face grading in the same class. Not much difference, really. And then I had a hybrid class. This was the capstone class in which one of the projects was to develop a online web conference. By 2000, I had moved from Maryland to Australia. The class had several teams. I forget whether it was three or four teams met in the classroom in Maryland and one team was purely online because we had online students there and there wasn't much difference between the quality of what was produced by each of the students and remember the instructor wasn't even in the classroom he checked into the classroom using diff distance technology. Problems of using that was solved way back, which helped me for the research. So I ended up with online lectures, knowledge reading, not so much the flipped classroom. There, cl there could be classroom sessions, and that all sort of ended up talking about blended learning. A set of exercises that were designed for authentic assessment and workplace emulation, which is a different goal to designing specific exercises in the classroom. And so when I looked at how those components in the subsystems related to Wickline's requirements, lectures don't tell you very much, exercises, well, they're experiencing them, and in the knowledge readings, they're experiencing some of them as well. So there isn't actually one component that will solve all the requirements. It's the system together that does that. And if I looked at Bloom's taxonomy in terms of evaluating the cognitive skills, lecturing has no evaluation of the cognitive skills because there's no feedback. Exercises, well, when you're doing an exercise based on the knowledge that you've acquired, yes, you can pretty much do levels one, two, and three. Four, five, and six are a little more difficult, but four, five, and six came in very nicely in the knowledge readings. And that get also gets over the flipped classroom approach. 
Grading was based on this. The benefit of it is students can pass the course with basic cognitive skills, so you don't fail type 2 students. They just get low grades. So when I put all those requirements together, I find that lecturing is not a very good way of demonstrating compliance to requirements. It's open loop. Exercises, yeah, they sort of, but it's difficult. Knowledge readings, I found, were the best way to show the knowledge. And they also went well beyond systems thinking. And the ability to handle open-ended, ill-defined problems depended on the external readings and the exercises. Ability to handle open-ended, ill-defined problems, those are type 3 and type 4 skills. And the cognitive skills, knowledge reading tested 5 out of 6. And, well, the individual assignment depended on the type of exercise or the type of assignment. And when they only present a single solution to a requirement, you can't tell whether they have seen multiple solutions. And individual exercise is definitely not teamwork. Here's an example of an exercise in risk management. Notice how I've highlighted the, the cognitive parts of it. Conceptualize at least two risks, at least one way of mitigating each identifying risk, and then produce a presentation, thinking about the problem and reformulating it, thinking about the lessons learned. There's the skill of cutting down everything to a less than five minute presentation. And then the knowledge readings, here's an example of a knowledge reading exercise, and the cognitive skills highlighted in yellow. Formulate the problem. Summarize the contents of the reading. Show the compliance matrix, show this slide and the version number of the lesson. That's when I look back later, a year later or so, I can see what they were actually exercising. List the main points. That comes from the summary. Reflect and comment. Compare content and bringing external knowledge. State why you think the reading was assigned to the module and summarize the lessons learned and so on. High cognitive content. Comments from students. When I taught this in class in Singapore and Brunei, I've learned to look at problems using systems thinking perspectives and generate ideas based on different perspectives. Learned systems thinking, critical thinking, holistic thinking. The course teaches me on how to think holistically and manage ideals using the tools. Applying techniques, applying systems thinking to real problems. Systematic concepts for identifying the problems. More importantly, I have learnt new perspectives to look at a system. The results in the grades, well, the initial grades match the student's behavior. They can be adjusted to curve by moving the changing threshold. Here's one class with one set of grades, not adjusted on a curve, and here's another class with a different set of grades, not adjusted on the curve, but you can see that the first one, where there's a minimum at B+, shows split cognitive skills. Students are more in the A's, or the lo lower B, or the B's, and the comments from students tend to reflect the cognitive skills. Students with high cognitive skills love the classes and complained it was a lot of work, but they learned an awful lot. Students with low cognitive skills didn't like that extra work. What did I actually produce out of this? Well, the 4% solution is a program with no time limit, 52 weeks, synchronous live weekly Zoom groups, and they're recorded. Do participants absorb material from the people who've been in the class longer? And they may not understand everything right away, but they soak it up in the way we traditionally learn things. The exercise emulate the real world, and so there are knowledge reading presentations as well. I can correct immediately any misinterpretations of the material that session. It doesn't have to wait till the exam at the end of the class. And participants can discuss real-world problems, so out-of-box experience in other domains. And we do that. And learning by absorption fast tracks the learning and the experience. You're getting the experience in another domain and you're learning to think about how you can apply what happened in that other domain to your situation. And there are also one-on-one -on -one sessions available. They can be booked anytime. There are asynchronous short lectures that introduce the topics and there are asynchronous discussions in the private LinkedIn group. We started in Facebook few of the participants had Facebook accounts. I found that a lot of systems engineers don't have Facebook accounts, so we moved it over to LinkedIn. 
The asynchronous discussions are very useful in that they allow people time to think before responding because there's no requirement to answer a question or make a comment right away. It's similar to posting stuff in LinkedIn and Facebook anyhow. We can put in notices of interest. Somebody will point out that there's something going on somewhere and they will copy it into the class group. Also add references to additional material of interest and resources and so on. And it's self-paced for individuals. There's no requirement to make a presentation each class. There's no requirement to complete the work each class. But beware procrastination and use just in time. The instructor becomes your coach and your mentor and that's at least $50,000 value if you work that out on an hourly basis at what highly qualified people charge. And it's a good opportunity to extend your personal network by meeting like-minded people facing similar problems in systems engineering and what to do about it when they see things differently to their colleagues. Course architecture. The lectures are self-paced, so you can stop them, you can replay part of them. This design was responsive to a few part participant comments that the lecture was too fast, especially when I'm dealing with students for whom English is a second language. This way they can play the lecture back until they understand it. The exercise allow you to participate applying what you've learned. You post your responses to the exercises in the asynchronous group, and a good source of material to use as comparison in the knowledge reading exercises can be found at ResearchGate and Google Scholar, as well as textbooks in your company or the university library. The interaction takes place in two ways, a live Zoom meeting and questions and comments in the asynchronous group within a specified time limit. When I started prototyping this, I offered participation free in December 2020 and January 21 to my past online students who showed potential type 5 characteristics and in COSI and the general public via LinkedIn. So what happened? There were 10 initial expressions of interest, 4 initial shows in the Zoom weekly sessions. None of the people who showed were in NCOSI as far as I know. Four more joined during 2021 and 2022, three dropped out. One is sort of active in the alternate live session. He has shown up in the Monday live session and actually made one presentation remotely. He recorded the presentation and we played that in class and commented on it. He viewed the comments the following week when he looked at that recorded session. One student graduated, that is, he went through all the, session, all the modules and did all the exercises and still drops in occasionally to take part in the discussions. The lessons learned, it's, well, it's post-postgraduate. This is not postgraduate and it's not for everybody. Free doesn't work. There's no need to complete an exercise before presenting it. Actually, it's preferable not to and I'll explain all these in a moment. Students show progress quickly. Students need time to adjust to this class. Is there too much content? Probably. It can be a lot of fun as well as being educational and further research is needed to find the optimal class size. I mean, any good research project ends up with the need for further research. Let's go through them. It's not postgraduate. It's post postgraduate because it doesn't fit into the semester or the traditional cohort type of class. You don't all start at the same time and go through it at the same rate. People are going through it at different rates. They're in different states. So some of the people are in module two, three. Other people are in modules four. One person's in module seven and so on. It all hangs together quite well. So it's a hybrid of the master apprentice and the classroom educational models. It's more than book learning. And most of the value is in the program architecture. You can read all the materials. They're all available. The value is in the interaction and the discussions of the material as well as the material and in the way it's done, which you don't get in the traditional postgraduate or continuing education workshop or class. Most traditional academics without real world experience could not lead this class format because you're making judgments all the time. You're using those higher cognitive skill levels all the time in this class. Participants can join any time. They learn by emotion and iteration. That's key as well. And there's a lot of shared real world experience in different domains. And there's no firm ending date. It's a resource. Participants can come back to it any time. 
it's not for everybody. Every session is different. I never know what's going to be discussed in a session because people do different exercises, people come with different problems, they tell different stories. And sometimes nobody has done an exercise, so we, we discuss a problem somebody's having or start applying some of those cognitive skills to a real world situation that's going on at the present time like COVID or Ukraine. So lesson plans are pretty useless. You can get a quick idea by looking in the LinkedIn group ahead of before the class session, but then not every student publishes in LinkedIn before making the online presentation. Sometimes the publication in LinkedIn comes later. So you need to be knowledgeable and experienced to guide the participants in reaching solutions. So we're creating knowledge in the class rather than telling as a traditional instruction. It's a master apprentice role. Students and participants, there's a high application rejection and initial dropout rate. People come to me, they want to be in the class, and I talk to them for a while, and I say no. I, somehow I don't push them or pull them into the class because I don't think they can handle it. And even though they did come in, there was a high dropout. Participants need the right aptitude and experience. Without that, they won't stay and they need to be internally motivated to learn and succeed. My classes are definitely not for minimum level of effort students. My classes that I teach or taught in the university and this program. I offered it for free. Free doesn't work. Motivation varies according to the circumstances. In the early days on, in Facebook, there were some lurkers in the Facebook group. Facebook tells me who's accessed the material. And I could see names there that never showed up in the weekly Zoom session. Finance is a motivator. It's a tangible incentive. I now charge enough dollars to make it serious. There is a list price, but there are generous discounts to Incosi. Nobody's taken me up on that so far. If somebody is really motivated and I see that they really want to be in and I think they can do it, there are ways to pay that make it doesn't hurt so much but it's got to hurt enough to make sure that the person is motivated to stay otherwise I've wasted my time and they've wasted their time the exercises are designed to emulate the real world of iteration some outstanding systems engineers prioritize and work iteratively until the schedule is resources they don't try and understand every point in a linear sequence they skim and go round and round until it's done. They, they know that how much time they have and they balance the time. That way they at least they don't get hung up on one point and spend all the time on that one point. NASA used a similar technique uh, in the Apollo program where every activity on the moon had a time limit. If it wasn't completed at the end of the time limit, stop, move on to the next one, come back if you've got time. Same technique that you you're supposed to use on answering multiple choice questions. Generic thinking. Similarity. If you think about live classroom exercises, they're only the first iteration because you only have 20 minutes to do the exercises. So some students can take four or five or six hours to do the exercise and I keep telling them, no, don't. Just take an hour. Get it down. Because when you're spending a lot of time to complete the exercise, you're really reinventing the wheel. They need to learn to present a work in progress even when the way forward is clear because they get comments and, it, and we discuss where should we go from here. We create knowledge. The student has a much better understanding of what's going on there because we show the mistakes along the way. And I actually use this process in the Oasis Cafe to develop this presentation or at least parts of it. it emulates peer reviews, informal, teamwork, and so on. The real world is not the academic world. These exercises emulate much of the real world. Students show progress quickly. Feedback is provided on content, correctness of content, presentation graphics, and layout. Exercises emphasize iteration and repetition. So the requirement, as I mentioned in the example exercise, Reformulate the problem according to the problem formulation template is a required part of every exercise. So they get practice using the tools and practice using the thinking. And sometimes we think about alternative ways of presenting the information. Should we use a bar chart or a radar plot to present the information? And why one way is better than the other way? 
and so sometimes ask the student show that information in a different way come back next session and we'll discuss the comparisons don't see that in traditional class and students can compare their presentations made in later sessions with those in the earlier sessions so somebody can look back to something they did two or three months ago and they go wow I'm so much better student need time to adjust to this class they're marred in the academic paradigm with respect to exercises. This is a different paradigm containing some different real-world emulation. It teaches a different paradigm. It's not, it's that gap, that chasm between good systems engineers and outstanding systems engineers. They need to learn the iterative approach to the exercises. And what's more, the exercises are optional. You don't have to do an exercise at all. But if you don't do them, it reduces the effectiveness of the learning. If somebody has a lot of work or family issues or something like that, they don't need to come to class and make excuses for not doing the exercise. The exercises are done when the person is able to do them. Although I will nudge people if they don't do exercises for a few weeks. So work, family and other commitments don't affect the learning. Mistakes that students make in the exercises are learning opportunities and provide discussion points. The best presentations are those that provide lots of learning opportunities. In the traditional classroom and in the real world, the best presentation are those that contain no mistakes. In the classroom, the best presentations are those that provide lots of learning opportunities. Does that mean they contain lots of mistakes? A learning opportunity is based on something that was done wrong or a way to improve something that was done meets the requirement, but it could be done in a better way. The readings are not meant to be read from start to finish. They should be scanned iteratively, gaining more understanding in each iteration. And that's mentioned at the front of each book. Too much content? Probably. I started with the traditional 10 modules at the beginning, and a module may have several parts. Each part of a module may have more than one exercise. Modules contain an introductory lecture and in-depth readings, and the website is designed for impact. When you go in there and look at the website, whoa, whoa, oh, hmm. That's probably why those people didn't show. Pure Systems Engineering changed from two modules into a separate prerequisite program. Two modules were not enough. I found that people were missing the concepts or either I wasn't, weren't, wasn't explaining them too well in two modules or they didn't pick it up. So I turned them into a different program called Creating Outstanding Problem Solvers. And it's a prerequisite program to creating outstanding systems engineers. Flexible content. If I need another module in depth on a CETA activity, one can be developed to order and becomes a resource. So I could, for example, put in an a in-depth module on requirements or a module on bringing systems engineering into an organization. Lots of people seem to be facing that, but they don't realize it. it's an organization change problem. Implementation domain is organization change. Let's see if you can be part of that 4%. Remember this, the 4%? How do you bridge the gap? Can you cross that gap? Do you have what it takes? Are you stuck in the type 2 process paradigm and want to get out of it? Are you interested in crossing that gap? Or are you interested in finding out if you can? Join me and a small group for at least 30 days for free. Full access to the two programs. Just go to my website and you can find the button that will take you to the class. Ask not if you can afford to do it. Ask rather if you can afford not to do it. In summary, I covered all this material. If you have any questions or comments, if you're interested and don't want to try the program at this time, talk to me and the others in the online Oasis Cafe using Zoom. I'm also online at other times. I really like to thank Bruce Lerner, Raid al and Shirley Tseng who made useful comments in the online Oasis Cafe during the preparation of this presentation. See, I use some of the techniques that I teach. Thank you very much for attending. For those of you who are in the session in the Chesapeake chapter meeting, I'll take questions and comments now.